Hello and hey, ladies and gentlemen. I am Professor Jellyfish and welcome to another part of Realism Review of Subnautica. This is a series where I will be examining the creatures in Subnautica and try to figure out how realistic they are when compared to real life animals. This is a series that will not only look at the design and look at the creatures, but will also consider the biomes and environments that I have found across in the game's world. This time we are going to have a look at a swimming cute little rodent. We will be looking at the Rabbit Ray. Now this is an organism that reminds me of multiple other organisms all at once. One of them is the ray we find in our own oceans. There is the shark ray and not the star wars ray. Okay. It also shows a striking resemblance to nudie branches, specifically the Spanish dancer. What is especially resembling about the rabbit ray and the Spanish dancer is that they can both swim through open water, a ability that most nudie branches don't possess. But now I am getting ahead of myself. So let's take a step back and examine what attributes the rabbit ray possesses. Well, it has a pair of ear-like appendages that is used to detect vibrations in the water. In front of these ears, it has two large side-facing eyes that are stated to be a recent development. The side of the creature's body is flattened into a pair of undulating fins or wings that are used for swimming through the water. The flesh of the creature is stated to be venomous which gives it few natural predators and also makes it a naturally curious little creature. It can also be observed staying close to the eggs that it lays. With all that out of the way, what can be stated about the rabbit ray? Well, first I want to talk about the poisonous flesh and how it has given it few natural predators. The reason why I want to talk about this is because poison is a rather interesting as a means of defense. Because like everything else on the animal kingdom, there is always an evolutionary arms race going on. One of the more interesting cases to talk about in this evolutionary arms race is the case of poisonous substances and the receivers. See, most poisons are made to attack or rather interact with very specific receptors or hormone within the receiver's body. To explain this, you can think of the receptor as a keyhole, and in this case the poison is a key that is meant to open the lock and to get into the house and burn everything to the ground. But of course, even master keys only work on very specific types of doors or in specific house blocks. A similar principle applies to the poison and the receptor. The poison will only be able to interact with specific receptors and if the receptor makes changes to its receptor, the poisonous effects will be weakened if not negated entirely. Let's, for the sake of argument, assume that the poison is targeting something rather important, like the receiver's method of transporting oxygen through its body. This does, however, come with an additional assumption, and this assumption has to do with the size of the rabbit ray's eyes. Most sea-living creatures in our oceans have their eyes placed on the side of their bodies to effectivize their streamlining, but creatures that are usually subjected to being prey are more inclined to grow large and cumbersome eyes in order to better see potential predators that might be trying to approach them. What does this mean for the rabbit ray though? Well, it means that there's a strong possibility that the poison that the rabbit ray is using to defend itself developed rather recently or became a lot more effective relatively recently. And by relatively recently, I mean that it might have happened several generations ago. Because if the rabbit ray was only able to develop the poison recently, it would still have to keep its large eyes, because those would have taken longer to reduce in size. But the in-game databank states something rather interesting here. It states that the large side-facing eyes are a relatively recent development. Depending on what exactly this means, this could imply different things. If the appearance of the eyes themselves are a recent development, this could that the rabbit eye was a blind species previously. Considering how many creatures in Subnautica have four eyes, this might very well be the case. So let's examine that. This could mean that the rabbit ray developed from a species that lived far more in light reduced environments. It could perhaps be an environment in permanent darkness. Under such conditions, there will be no need for the creature to develop eyes because there will be no light to see things with. However, the existence of bioluminescence on the edge of the rabbit ray's fins implies that it might have been able to perceive light to some extent. 
Though it is of course possible for the bioluminescence to have been developed at a later stage after the addition of ice. This would mean that the rubber tray would have had to develop its bioluminescence after it developed its ice. The game game data bags makes no mention of this, so the theory might either be wrong or information is simply missing. But what about the other possibility? That being that the size of the eyes are a relatively recent development. This makes for some rather interesting possibilities. It could mean that the rabbit ray had eyes previously, but they were rather small or underdeveloped. This means that the eyes were either not used often, or they were not especially important for the rabbit eye's perception of its surroundings. That, or they could have only been used to sense the differences between light and dark. This could imply that the rabbit ray was a species that used to live in far deeper and darker waters. Even if the eyes were underdeveloped, they could have been used to sense changes in light levels. This implies something even more interesting. But before I get into that, I must explain a phenomenon that occurs on our own planet almost every single day. This phenomenon is called Divertical Migration, or DVM for short. DVM is the process by which plankton, particularly zooplankton or annual plankton as they are otherwise known, migrate through the water column during the night in order to feed on the phytoplankton close to the surface. The reason that they migrate is to avoid predators that would otherwise eat the zooplankton if they were to migrate up during the day. This is a rather extreme migration that may see some zooplankton travel as or as thousands of meters per uh, water column per night. Essentially this means that they will not only have to be adjusting to the extreme changes in water pressure, but they will also have a need to be able to sense when the sun returns to the surface. In order to do this they need something to sense the increase of light, a photosensitive spot, or an eye if you will. This phenomenon will not be unlikely to occur on an alien planet, and it could also mean that the rabbit ray might have previously been a species that are far more keen on migrating through the water column and thus only needed relatively simple eyes in order to detect the differences between light and dark so that it would have known when it was time to return to deeper water. So in conclusion, there is reason for the rabbit ray to have developed the large eyes relatively recently, though it is subject to some speculation. The poisonous flesh though is rather believable and it might have been the reason for the rabbit ray's bright and strong coloration. When an animal is poisonous to eat, it wants to advertise that or show off that trying to eat it is a bad idea. This is something that can be seen repeated with a lot of neuter branches who have a slight amount of knidocyte or the burning part of a jellyfish's tentacles. The reason they want to advertise is rather simple. It means that predators learn to stay away from it without the creatures having to be bitten in the first place. To quote Sun Tzu, To fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence is breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. In other words, the rabbit ray is one of the most badass creatures in Subnautica according to a 2000 year old Chinese general. This might have contributed to the inquisitive nature that can be observed by the rabbit ray in game. Like the famous now extinct dodo, when an animal has few to no natural predators, they will naturally become less careful with oncoming generations. This is a useful strategy when you have no natural predators, because the organisms will be examining everything they come across, increasing its chances to find a new source of nutrients and spend less energy constantly escaping from predators. The downside is, of course, if a predator either gets introduced into the environment or evolves naturally, the creature will not have the means or the, a strategy of defense against this predator. A good case example of this is the previously mentioned dodo. The bird lived for many generations without any natural predators in its environment, and when it got introduced in the form of humans and cats, the dodo had no means of defense and it had no instinct to tell it to avoid predators. This resulted in the animal becoming rapidly extinct. So the rabbit ray might be setting itself up for a quick extinction if any natural predators were to manage to become immune or resistant against the poison that the rabbit ray produces. But none of this makes the rabbit ray unrealistic. 
This is just an observation of what might be happening with the animal in the near future. Now onto the ear-like appendages close to the rabbit ray's head. These are very strange little appendages. Most creatures that swim around the water column have something akin to an ear in order to better perceive their surroundings and being able to better detect incoming predators. So the rabbit ray developing something like this is not only believable, but it is also necessary for the rabbit ray in order to survive. The question then becomes, is it practical or useful in this case? Well, for one, they are described as hard, which does not necessarily mean that they are better or worse at detecting surrounding environments. Upon closer inspection though, it might be explained. The ears have spores or holes in them. They also appear to have been some kind of pattern running parallel along the length of the ears. They also extend close to the head of the rabbit ray and appears to sink into the flesh. This is something rather interesting. So let's speculate. Spores and patterns on the ears might imply that the ears have nerves or some other means of detecting movements in the water surrounding it. This is quite similar to the lateral line that normal fishes have. Along the lateral line there are little pores that let water in and lead into nerve clusters that will detect vibrations in the surrounding water. I would suspect that this is what is inside the rabbit ray's ears and what might help it detect vibrations in the surrounding waters. The placement close to the head might also imply that the rabbit ray wants them closer to the head in order to have the signal travel as fast as possible to its brain, presumably inside its head skull. But there is a problem with these ears. The problem with the ears is their placement. They would not be able to detect or have very reduced detection from signals coming from below the rabbit ray. This will be downright devastating, because it is a common tactic for predators to strike their prey from below, and this would be very detrimental for a creature that is actively swimming around the water column. It also flies in the face of my previous speculation that the rabbit ray might have developed from a deep sea species that swam through the water column. It seems to imply that the rabbit ray may have once been a bottom-dwelling species, similar to our own nudibranches, or at the very least, may have been a species that spent most of its time on the bottom. I say this because the rabbit ray would not need to sense vibrations in its surrounding water if it spent most of its time on the bottom of the ocean, especially if it is poisonous, meaning it would not need to be able to detect incoming predators. This might imply that the ears are also a recent development, or at the very least that the rabbit ray has spent most of its time on the ocean floor. But the main issue is of course the placement of the ears. So the change that could be done is that the rabbit ray simply gets an additional pair of ears below its belly in order to better detect vibrations from below. Moving on to the maternal care of the rabbit ray. It is described as being willing to safeguard her eggs by usually staying around them, presumably until they hatch. Here is actually where the bioluminescence might become a utility for the rabbit ray and I might about it like I otherwise would. From the behavior of the rabbit ray, it can be assumed that the eggs does not produce the same poison as the adult form does. This means that the adult will have to watch over the egg until it hatches and here it might use the bioluminescence surrounding its body in order to confuse predators. The display of color might be a way for the adult to tell predators to back off unless they want to bite down on something poisonous. Depending on how long the reproduction cycle is though, the adult may in fact die from reproducing. This is not entirely uncommon in the animal kingdom. For example, the octopus will in fact give their lives to make sure that their eggs are hatched. The rabbit ray might do that as well by refusing to leave its egg side until it hatches. How it might die is simply from starvation. Some animals will simply not eat when they are guarding their eggs and will eventually die to make sure that their eggs are hatched. Other species, like the ever charming sevenback or Cyclopetrius lumpus, for my international audience, will spend several weeks guarding their eggs and will not even leave the spot they put the eggs down on even if the tide strands them. And you thought parenting was rough. So to conclude, the rabbit ray is a realistic creature, but it has some rather confusing or contradictory information about it, which makes it difficult to determine how it might have evolved. That's all I have for you today. If 
If you liked the video, please be sure to like, comment and subscribe. And I'll see you all next time.